Welcome to another edition of the 1% Better Podcast with your host, Rob O'Donoghue. Hello there. How are you doing? Hopefully well. Hopefully it's a Friday if this is the day you're listening to it on and you're in a good place. I'm in a good place. I'm in a different place, actually, from where I normally am recording these intros location-wise. We had to move out of the house for a couple of months as we're doing a bit of an extension. And that will, luckily for me, involve uh, more of a dedicated space to do recording, a bit of an office space and studio. uh, Certainly a bit more purposeful than the one I had before, which will now become my little boy's bedroom, which is overdue as well. But... Out on location at the minute recording this uh, through a handheld microphone that's going into my laptop, one I would have used at the start of this whole journey, but I think the sound is pretty good when I tested it. I forgot how good this microphone is. use it a lot when I'm roving and doing a bit of Vox Pop stuff. So that's where I'm at. Hopefully you're at a good place yourself and just wanted to check in on a couple of other bits going on before I introduce this week's guest. Over the last week, I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, listener numbers have gone up. In the last week, every day of the week for the last seven days have been record daily numbers. And it, again, may have something to do with the guests that I've had, for sure. Um, But something seems to have happened in numbers over the last few weeks, which is, is really good. What I'd love, though, is if you're a new listener, if you're somebody in the US, because I think the vast majority of listeners in the last while have, have come from there, drop me a note. Let me know if you're enjoying the show, what episodes you are listening to, if there's anything that you have questions on. I'd love to answer them, either here or a separate kind of answer questions show, or just email me, rob at rob of the green. I'm always interested to hear feedback on how things are going, if you're liking what you're hearing, and more. Speaking of which, I'm lucky to have engaged with a master's group of social media experts, and they've been doing a bit of critiquing on the show for me over the last while on the website and the the editing and all things involved there so getting some free consulting from those guys thanks for that you know who you are i appreciate it one of the things that did stand out was sound quality and not just the quality of my voice in general but the actual sound when you're listening to the episode from the car or on a train or for wherever you are and they said that the sound quality was a little bit low so in the last week's episode with Rana Gujral I tried to ratchet that up a good bit and hopefully that worked if if you are listening to it in any remote location or find it difficult sometimes to hear please do let me know Um, I've been told that a couple of times before and I've tried to increase the sound so I guess it's easier for you to turn it down than to turn it up and if you hit the turn up maximum and it's still not loud enough they're a bit of trouble so that's invaluable feedback for me it's something that I am taking on board and hopefully trying to rectify it shouldn't be difficult another piece of feedback was around the website trying to get to the episodes easier so I'm trying to add in some simplifications to the site there and that's not my forte at all in an ideal world i'd have somebody helping with the website design making it more mobile friendly user friendly and also helping me with other parts so i could just concentrate on interviewing folks and maybe putting more detail into the notes and sharing more episodes more frequently so i'm open to the feedback i love hearing it and as long as it's constructive uh please send it my way that would be awesome I did mention last week's episode, Rana Gujral, CEO of Behavioural Signals. Some really interesting insights there. Reflecting was the key takeaway that I had from that one with Rana. He is somebody that has been successful as an entrepreneur and as a CEO. And he puts a lot of that down to reflecting regularly and making sure when he's making decisions that he's took the right amount of time to to get there so check that one out if you're interested in business but also in artificial intelligence and emotional intelligence and how they're interconnected which they are becoming more and more of this week's episode is with a gentleman who i met uh, last year he was over in ireland for a visit and a, a friend's 40th his name is greg herman and he is 
uh, very much a creative soul. He is a, a designer of accessories, primarily handbags, and his brand, House of Herman, has been around for, I think, roughly 20 years or so. His story is very interesting in that it faced, and he faced, addiction, struggles, failures, reincarnations of himself, of his brand, and he learns along the way, of course, and he shares a lot of that in a very honest interview that I'm sharing with you guys now. Some really interesting takeaways. He mentions something around ego that stood out for me, and he mentions God and how important he is to him. And yeah, I think it's one that you'll enjoy diving into creativity, as I mentioned, but also getting under the hood of who Greg is and who he perceives himself to be right now and what he's learned along the way. So it is a 1% better from a creativity perspective, focusing on handbags if you want a hook, but there's a lot more to it than that. Very much enjoyed it. Thanks for your time, Greg. And I hope you listening enjoy this one. And as I said again, please do take a few minutes out to either get in touch with me, give me feedback. If you couldn't be bothered doing that, that's okay. Maybe just take a minute or two of your time telling somebody else you know if you like the show they might enjoy it too uh give it a like give it a share on facebook but only if it's of value all right i'll leave it there hope the intro was okay sounded okay and i hope you enjoy the show thanks a lot good luck Hey folks, welcome to another episode of the 1% Better Podcast. I will be releasing this one, I think, in what I'm calling Season 3. It'll be in 2019, and um not sure at what stage of Season 3 early on, but uh, it's, one, it's probably a, a new topic that I haven't touched on before in the world of, of fashion. Um, and I'm talking with Greg Herman, who is the... I suppose, owner of House of Herman. Would that be right to say? Or how, how would you define what you do, Greg, and what you own? Well, I think what uh, Greg Herman is, is it, it's it's less of House of Herman, but more of a brand. Okay. Um, it's a, you know, brand. It, we, we, we're a brand of accessories, um, handbags. And over the past nine months, we've had mass expansion. Um, and now we have a full jewelry line. Um, that's going that we're collaborating with in Tokyo. Um, we have two apparel lines, one called Shades of Black Los Angeles, which I'm collaborating on, um, which is a um, that's it's it's a very it's a very interesting line because it's a um, it's gender neutral. So it's for both men and women. Um, I have another collection, which is springboarding off of that one, which is more of a higher end luxury group. And as of probably about two months ago, I've expanded into a full um, houseware line, which consists of everything from um, linens, napkins, tablecloths, um, a full apron line, which I'm developing with uh, Ricardo Zarate, which happens – he happens to be one of the top chefs right now, um, probably one of the top chefs in the world, mm. um, along with uh, a full-blown wallpaper line which I'm developing. So I, we can get into that, but that's pretty much everything. It's huge. <laughs> it's a brand. So so like brand. I would imagine when when uh, it started, it it wasn't was your vision for it to explode like that or, or was it very much just focused on on the on the bags? Um it was very much very much the bags. You know, I've had I've had many different um you know, the Greg Herman brand when it first began in 1995, 96, it really took, it really, it really took on many different versions. Um, some I, some I never thought would actually materialize. Some did. Um, what, it, you know, I never knew what it originally was going to be. I still don't know what it's going to exactly be. <laughs> it, it kind of evolves on a daily basis. Hmm. Um, when I, when I, do you want me? I don't know how much you want me to keep going yeah, into yeah. this. Yeah, um, no, yeah. That's cool. Like, so, so I guess it's evolving on a daily basis. You, you said ninety five, ninety six. Is that when it was born? Is that like? Is that something you had all? What was the planning that went into that point in time to say I'm going to start a, a, a fashion brand? 
Um, I think what happened is it, it, it kind of happened, you know, way before that. Um, you know, I was I was in Los Angeles. I went. I lived abroad. Um, so I was living outside of outside of Cambridge in a, in a village uh, in Pinkton, which is in the um, UK. In England, really nobody knows it. Yes, okay. yes, and which uh, nobody nobody really knows about. Um, and I think it was really there, which when fashion really started, I started to connect with it. And it was at that juncture that my my sister at that point, who was a teenager, um, you know, she had you know really bad cancer, and it was a really it was a really rough time. You know, it was it was just it was my mom who was raising us. Um, and I really felt, and, and I and I went to university, and I, I did all of that, and I, I thought like I need something greater. I needed to leave more of a creative legacy just more for myself. Um, and I thought, you know, sometimes when you look at the end of the rainbow, you know, we, you, you, everybody looks for the pot of gold. And when you get there, you realize there's a pile of shit and you got to go back to the beginning of the rainbow hmm. and kind of carve out your own, your own world and, and figure out what you want for you versus what everyone else wants for you because they're vastly different. Hmm. And I think that, you know, I had to really kind of step back take a beat and really look at what was good for me versus what everyone wanted for me or thought what was good for me. And I think when you grow up as I grew up, which is, it was in a very, very difficult environment, um, a tumultuous environment, um, you know, grew up with substance abuse all over, you know, my family members were, 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 were just, indulging let's just say mm. in, in many substances so you know it's like you're kind of when at a young age you're, you're you're pretty much left to fend for yourself mm. um and i think it haven't probably even happened way before that i was I, I got into the arts and i got into everything from sculpting to pottery to painting and i think that was really my outlet growing up um because it was pretty much with me it was just about me growing up with me and mm. figuring things out and <laughs> So did you just maybe even take a step back? So just when when you were where where did, where did you where did you come from? Where did you um, you know start out? Um, started you know grew up in Los Angeles. Okay. So and, and you moved to the UK with with your mom and sister. Was that was that part of uh, you know an early transition or or maybe just tell me a little bit how you I suppose got to that point. Um. Actually, I I moved there by myself. I okay. actually came home and I said I'm moving. <laughs> I got a, I met this, um, so as, as I, I really was, I was young and into the teenage years, I really, you know, I, I, I really wanted to pursue theater and I wanted to pursue film and I, I really loved acting and I got an opportunity, um, to go out there and study okay. and I seized that. And so I went out with a small group of people and I studied theater and modern drama um, and, you know, just, just really, I needed to get away. I, I really needed to get away from, from Los Angeles. I needed to get away from, you know, all of this stuff that was going on. And it really allowed me to clear my head and then come back in and, and then really kind of come back to Los Angeles with, with, with fresh eyes. Mm -hmm. Um, there was something that I needed from the UK that it's something that it gave me. Um, something that it offered me, it, it, it offered me just a re able to see the world through many different prisms, which I hadn't seen before. Um, and so it really inspired me to go into, in, in, into, in, go into this more of a creative world, this creative zone. Mm. So I, but it wasn't, but when I, but when I came back to Los Angeles, I ended up at going to UCLA, which was a, uh, a university out here in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. and I ended up graduating in a with a degree of anthropology. And then, you know, I thought I was going to go be this and be that and be this and that. And the problem is, is I was being everything that I didn't want to be. Mm. What I really wanted to be is I really wanted to be in in the world of fashion. Mm. And so I started, and from that point, I started really getting into designing handbags. Um, I was introduced by a man named Leopold Page. Um, and Leopold was a fascinating man. Leopold was one of the, he was the inspiration for a movie called Schindler's List. Mm -hmm. Um, 
which uh, Spielberg ended up doing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Leopold Page was was a survivor, concentration camp survivor, and I was introduced to him, and he was in the world of bags, and I was I, I kind of became inspired by him by him, and I started picking up these. I started meeting all these people who I was lucky to have come into my life as role models and really inspire me. And then I eventually, you know, started to evolve the world of my creative arts. And I ended up, um, you know, Joel Gray, who was a, was an amazing man. He was, um, he's Jennifer Gray's father. He was one of the leads of Cabaret with Liza Minnelli. Mm. Um, Joel came into my life and he really inspired me to really follow what I wanted to follow. And, you know, little bits of pieces of that started coming into my life and people started coming to, into my life and throwing little things at me. And mm. sometimes what I've realized, Rob, it's, it's, it's not a matter of the, it's not the big things that get thrown at you in life that you hold on to and you are, are the aha moments. It's those little things that really get thrown at you and you kind of, they kind of add up into one big thing. Mm. And I think it's for me personally, it was all about seeing those little things getting thrown at me and making them into into the big thing mm. little piece here little piece here little piece there little person that person comes into my life that person comes and i've had some of the most magical worldly people who have come into have come into my life who have really inspired me i mean things that i've done people who i've met um you know like i said from joel to people like um Jared Leto, who who we were good friends when we were young, and people who like that who have come into my life who've really inspired me. We've been able to all grown together in a world where we started in LA, and a lot of us were nobodies, mm -hmm. and a lot of us became somebodies, and we didn't even care about being somebodies. <laughs> like, I, I'm I'm absolutely fascinated by what you've just been kind of talking about and how one thing that came up early on when you mentioned when you were in the UK and you know when I suppose when you started to have that internal battle of I'm not going to be the person I'm maybe meant to be or uh, others might want me to be I want to kind of go after what I feel is right what was it that that made you kind of make that that determination or I, I generally like to talk about this kind of area of emotional intelligence and and getting to know yourself well and and searching inside yourself to figure that out was there anything that started that rolling for you that helped you make that decision i think it was about being part of something mm. i think i think it was really about being i became part of something but you know i, I grew up not being not being part of anything mm. and a lot, and that's what happens. You know, John Lasseter said, you know, when when asked of over Pixar, he said, "What what made um, he says, why do why do why do all these Pixar films succeed? What what is the story? What why are they so successful?" He says, "Because they all come from broken homes." Hmm. And I think that we all want to become part of something because there's something in us that's broken, and I think. I became part of something, but also more importantly, I became part of myself. I evolved as a human and I was lucky and I was fortunate to be in, to get myself into therapy when I was younger and, and really have, really have some self-awareness. Hmm. And I think having that self-awareness led me to this kind of, this world that I created where I finally felt like I was part of me. And I was part of something. Obviously, if you can't be part of something unless you realize you're, you know, you ex you, you be you become part of you, you accept you. It's it's the idea that you can't love unless you love yourself. Hmm. Yeah, I, I think you've mentioned luck a few times, right? So I believe I'm not going to throw out cliches of you know the harder you work, the luckier you get, and all of that. But um, I think there there's some. There, there's certainly some truth in um, chance and, and, and fate maybe is, is that anything you would believe in or or was it more purely you were starting to show talent in, in the area of, of what you were looking at and then that got noticed how do you think that kind of started to develop well 
I think it was I think it was talent, but I also was I also one of one of my mantras, which I live and die for. I mean, it is it is it is. I wake up in the morning and and is what I believe and it's what I it's it's what I eat it's what I drink it's what I listen to is that you know you can't be in you can't be in faith and fear at the same time mm-hmm. they they can't coexist mm-hmm. you know f- faith and fear you can't I've realized I I have a, a good friend of mine and you know he said something which was really really profound I see I, I, he's like you know Greg he's like I'm before I go out for an interview before I do anything in life. Before I go out for, you know, um, a meeting or a dinner and I'm nervous about it, he says, I leave the door open for two seconds. And I said, well, well, why do you do that? He said, because I let God walk in first. He says, if I leave the door open for two seconds and let God walk in first and I follow, I leave my ego at the door. Hmm. And I thought that's a fascinating way of, of doing life. Hmm. It's a beautiful way of doing life. The fact that you can go ahead and leave a door open for two seconds and you walk and you let God walk in first and you follow, you leave your ego at the door. Because ultimately, what does ego stand for? It stands for edging God out. Hmm. Because those two things can't exist. Your ego and faith can't exist together. It's interesting. They just can't. Yeah, I, I you probably know Rosanna Arquette or, or know of her from from LA. Sure. I interviewed her for the podcast uh, earlier this year, um, and one of the lines that she mentioned that I just comes up when you mentioned that is is being living living in gratitude because once you're in gratitude, you're you're you know you're, you're not anxious, you're not in fear. Um, so there's probably parallels to to what you're you're mentioning there. Well, I think that at the end of the day, I think. You know, when you look at graciousness, isn't that everything? Mm-hmm. You know, it, it was it was interesting. It's like I yesterday I walked up to somebody and and I had a, a I like doing this from time to time. Is I have I had a conversation with just a random person. Mm-hmm. It was amazing that here was this person that was sitting there that was in so much hurt and so much pain, and all they wanted to do was probably have that that one person that walked up to them and actually said something to them, change their whole entire life. For that day, yeah. for that moment, and I think that we as humans need to do more of that, and with that be- becomes gratitude. You mentioned God. Uh, is 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 God and and religion a core part of your your holistic self? Yeah, I think so. I think it really. It, 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 you know, I think it's something that I do on a daily basis. I think that I I do have this really higher power spiritual connection that um i really get into um i really come to realize and i think that's happened it happened at a really young age that i've realized that i can't really um i can't really do it by myself you know i think i think this life i think the i think doing life is a very difficult endeavor mm. um i think it's a very it, it's 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 very trying. It's very taxing. But if you can go and you can wake up every day and you could have God by your side, why wouldn't you? I think why why not? Sure. And so I've 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 come to accept that from luck. I was very lucky to have that at a very young age, and to to be able to experience these these real spiritual connections, these godly connections that I was able to embrace. And come to realize that hey, you, you got to have it in your life. At least for for me, I have to have that in my life. I have to have that on a daily basis. I have to have you know. I would say I have to have God as a co-pilot, mm. <laughs> and which is really funny because I think that also opened up my eyes to a lot of things. When I first started my company back, you know, in 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 the mid '90s, I remember that the man that that came to me, he was a man, amazing guy from Hoboken, New Jersey. And he said to me, he's like, I, I, he said to me, you know, I know you're in the back business. I know that's what you want to do. I know you're having, you know, struggles and you want to start. He says, can I give you some money to start? And he was this amazing born again, Christian man. And, you know, he, he basically gave all his money away to everybody who asked for it, who needed it. And 
you know, I thought it was kind of, well, that was, that was, that was a God shot. You know, that was put into my life for a reason. That's, that's kind of what I believe. I believe God put, there's no, nothing happens in God's world by mistake. Mm. So, and, and I don't think God will give me more than I can handle. And I believe that. Mm. Yeah, no, I, you know, I, 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 I totally know. And I, I believe what, what, what you're kind of explaining it. Was there a point along the journey when you started to notice these things happening to you um, for for the better and and where you started to maybe trust in the process even more knowing that I'm just going to it feels right I'm on the right path I'm you know I mightn't have you know a million dollars in the bank or I might be sc- scrambling to get you know this next shipment out or, or whatever those challenges were but you wanted to stay the course because you felt there was something bigger uh, further down the road and, and other things kept coming towards you was there a point where you started to trust you were on the right p- p- path um, you know I think I, I did start to try I, I started to I wasn't sure where the path was going to take me or was going to lead me hmm. um, but but I I, I I did have some trust that it was going to take me it was I didn't you know honestly I, I don't know where it was going to take me I'm I, I will be honest in this uh, in, in that where I, when I start an endeavor, I never think it's ever going to fail. Hmm. Never. There's not one time that I've ever gone into a business endeavor into anything where I've ever thought it was going to fail. Because success was so amb- it was such an ambiguous term. Hmm. We define success as like the er- a monetary gain. And for me, going into stuff, going into endeavors was never about the monetary gain. So no matter what I did, making the the decision, just to make the decision to go ahead and do something was a success. Hmm. Because sometimes we hide behind all these successes. We hide behind a fear of success. So a lot of us never even try it. So for me... It was all about no ma- just making the decision to start something was a success. There was no failure. Mm-hmm. I, I think that in society we think that monetary the monetary gain from from a business or any sort of endeavor is is def- defined success, and I I, I I don't think so. Not mm-hmm. for me, at least. Yeah. It's... And so when I go ahead. Yeah. No. It's, it's interesting. I think the. The, the the European or maybe Irish, definitely speaking from an Irish perspective, view of of failure. If if we set up a business and we fail at it, you know you you are kind of brandished um, to to say that you're never going to be successful. Whereas in in the US, the sense I get from talking to to people like yourself and and others in in the entrepreneurial game have had this you know no fear attitude that yeah they go in if they if they, if it doesn't work out. They learn a lot mm-hmm. from it, and next time round, they're better to do it. So it's almost promoted as opposed to uh, scoffed at or, or scorned upon. But um, but I, I think that's the best way. That's the right way uh, to, to to have it. Well, I think that if you look at, the, I always loved. I always love looking at the definitions of words. It's it's one of my thing. I have a dictionary in my car, mm. and I always love looking looking at words. And if you really Look at the definition of success. It says obsolete outcome results. 2A, a degree of measure of succeeding. A favorable or desired outcome. Also the attainment of wealth, favor, or eminence. Mm. Three, one that succeeds. But what is – it's also how you define wealth. Mm. And that's the thing that they don't define. Yeah. Nothing in here says money. Nothing in here says I made a million dollars and therefore I'm a success. Sure. Yeah, no. Nothing in this definition. I think we, we walk around the world and we hold on to words and we hold on to uh, ideas that are built upon words that have been fed to us for so long. <laughs> and those aren't reality. Yeah. Because when you look at the words and you look at the definitions of them, they're completely the opposite of what we thought they were. Yeah. Not There's nothing in wealth that says I made $5 million and I'm now a success and I can now like retire. Never says that. Oh, I agree. I think we're... 
like I could do a whole hour talking about language and uh, you talk about using a dictionary <laughs> to get the, the definitions. I, I'm very fascinated about the etymology of words, of, of their origins as well. And um, I think it was on a podcast I was listening to recently that just blew my mind when uh, you you might have heard the book Sapiens by uh, Yuval Harari. I don't know if you've heard of it. No. It's all about homo sapiens anyway, but they they talked about uh, I suppose back in the 16, 1500s or even earlier when words way earlier probably when words were being when language had been formed and they basically when you spell a word the actual meaning of the word spell is actually creating a spell like a magic piece of putting a thing together to make a word out of it as opposed to because uh-huh. it just I know we just we just because we think of the word spell we think it's just how you put the letters after each other to make a word but the real underlying meaning is uh, it's kind of like a magic potion of sp- casting a spell to make a word um but but like yeah we're, we're all just conditioned in so many ways to just understand what these things mean when they actually have no real meaning underneath it all it's just how we're brought up so so i agree we're when you hear success people are always for the most part um tying uh, a monetary value potentially to that but i think that's that's setting yourself up for failure probably straight away you know so Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 100 percent. i think that's what i i saw in my business you, you mentioned therapy um and you mentioned you know being growing up you were exposed to, to substance abuse and, and that what did you learn from therapy that has helped you move forward has helped you grow um wow i think most importantly what i've learned is that you know that i'm okay and i always was okay Mm. i think that um I think the idea that we we always, at least for me, what I learned from therapy was that what I was feeling at that very moment was exactly what I was supposed to be feeling at that very moment. Mm. And that I was exactly where I was supposed to be. And that the, it was all about pretty much ex- the acceptance and expression of feelings. And knowing that those were okay to have. Mm. And finding a safe place within myself to really harness those. And I think that was a really important thing. You know, there's a great saying, and I don't know if you've heard it, Rob, they say you're as sick as your secrets. Hmm. And then you wake up and you realize your secrets weren't sick. You were just afraid to talk about them. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I think that's a really beautiful phrase. I think that's a really beautiful phrase where it's like, well, you're as sick as sick as your secrets. And so you kind of attach to this idea that, wow, I can't tell anybody this. Oh, I can't tell somebody this. Oh, this is not good. Oh, this is bad. This yeah. is shameful. This is guilty, blah, blah, blah. And I, and, and you come to realize that none of that is real. Mm-hmm. And, and I think a lot of, a lot of people like myself and artists, and I, and I would say probably I could speak for 99.9% of the artists out there who are afraid to pursue what they want to pursue is because shame holds them back. Mm -hmm. Shame is such a motivating factor to not do anything or to do the opposite of what you really want to do. Shame that you're not going to be good enough, that you're not going to take a nine to five job, that you're not going to make this money. Shame that, you know, you're not a a, a dentist or a doctor or this or that. It's all shame driven. Mm. Where do you think it comes from? You know, that's interesting. I think it comes from just the idea of society saying you need to be this, you need to have this to be good enough. Mm. And, you know, it's interesting. You look at what Facebook and social media has done and it's driven all of the, you know, it's all these people who were lurking in the shadows who always wanted to be famous or wanted to be popular or wanted to do this. It's kind of given them an outlet to do that. Mm-hmm. to be f- popular amongst their group. I, you, know, you know, I've never had a Facebook account. I've never wanted to have a face. It's funny because Facebook, they, they, they gave me a, a public figure profile. And I never wanted it. 
<laughs> never wanted it, never logged into it, never signed up for it. Just didn't want it. Yeah. And I built a pretty large social media following, not that I wanted to, mm-hmm. <laughs> inside the world of Twitter and and Instagram, not because I wanted to, because it just kind of evolved that way. Yeah. And that's what's interesting. The people who are those dentists are those are this and that. Just your kind of your normal layman. They've they want to like be the most popular in their group, and that's and they want to show off their egos. And they want to show off this. Mm. You know, in two thousand and two thousand and one, I was featured twice in Entrepreneur Magazine. Oh. I was in I was in Jane Magazine almost monthly. I was probably in about three different magazines on a monthly basis, mm. featured. I never picked up those magazines. <laughs> My mom did. Mm. Other people did. They would mm. call me up and go, "Hey, I saw you in on- I saw you in in New York. You know, I saw you in LA Magazine. I saw you. I didn't care. Mm. Didn't care about that. It was all about the art. That's a- Most people I know who are in entertainment and fashion, they could care less about the stardom. Yeah. Well, that- they want to create. I'm sorry. No, like, and that that's. Um... Like I, I think that's really important, obviously, because if you're in it for the stardom or w- whatever accolades you want uh, to to get from it, if you don't get them quite quickly, you'll you'll lose uh, belief, motivation, whatever. I I, I kind of not not in the same scale, but even with podcasting, people I've talked to have started their podcast because they wanted their million downloads and they wanted a million followers, and then after five or six episodes when they realize it doesn't happen that way they give up um you know i'm 99 episodes in or whatever and i don't have any of those things but i'm i'm learning so much from it and i'm getting to talk to people like yourself about their own journey so you know it's again goes back to what success is and and how you define it and and following the passion and following the art is uh is what it's all about so you know i i I hear you uh totally and I, i think it's refreshing that that you, you don't even know these things are, are published out there and uh, you just keep the, the head down. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's funny. I find out I find out things about me that I didn't even know. I'll find out. I'll, I'll look up and I'll, you know, everything. There's like, it'll, there'll be out sites out there and it'll, it'll let me know who I'm dating. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it, it's it's pretty much, and in, in the in the whole, and you know, it's interesting because I want to address the whole idea about being better, you know, mm-hmm. about, that that one percent better and you know and and i've really i've really sat on it and i thought about it and i've and 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 i love i really love it i love the idea about being i i want to wake up and be one percent better to myself and i find that i don't need to be 10 or 20 or 30 40 50 80 percent better i just need to be one percent better because i feel like that one just just striving for the one percent opens up those other percentage points Hmm. and it really seen it through that prism has really made me it's really made me think and it's amazing how just making that one shift pivoting that one percent can really open up the universe Hmm. and not worrying about doing an 80 percent pivot or a 90% pivot, or I'm waking up and going, I'm going on that diet. No, I'm just going to cut out cheese today. Yeah. That's it. I'm not going to go. That's it. Yeah. It's a simple shift. Yeah. And I've, I've come to realize, and this is one of the big things, Rob, that have, has really changed my life. And I think that I, I hope that your listeners can take this is that what happens at 9 15 in the morning, the emotion the fear, the anxiety that happens at 9.15 in the morning is not going to be the same at 9.20. Mm-hmm. And that if you don't, if, if you can let go of the fear, the anxiety, the craziness at 9.15, you'll be all right. And know that you're gonna have it's gonna you're gonna have a different emotion at nine sixteen and nine seventeen and nine twenty, mm-hmm. and know that what you're feeling right now is not necessarily gonna be in an hour from now. I think the idea that what what really has gone to me also through tough times 
is the idea that what I'm feeling at 930 is not going to be the same feeling at 940. Mm -hmm. And it's it's important to just to, to remind yourself that so that, you know, a thought becomes an emotion becomes a, ra a rabbit hole down and you're, you're you're you know you're in a bad place within within mm -hmm. seconds because you know we think so rapidly from that perspective do you have any technique or or tool to take yourself out of that thought at nine fifteen to know that in a minute's time i could be feeling totally different what, what do you do to uh pull back you know what i do i, I pick up the phone and i listen to someone else hmm one of the things I do, first I take a big breath, and then I pick up the phone, and I call someone else. Mm -hmm. And when I call someone else, it really, it really makes it, it really. I, I find that after I pick up that phone and call someone else, my problems aren't as big. Mm. And ultimately, it comes. It, it's about being a service. Mm. It's about being a service to others. I find my greatest successes in life is of being service. I design bags, not and and and, and other, you know, it's like I, this jewelry line and all these other things that I'm designing. I'm designing because I want to design them. Because those things that I design create and spark an emotion in another human being. Mm -hmm. That's what's so beautiful about the arts is that you can create something that changes an emotion in another human being from all around the world that the distribution of the art coexists with distribution of emotions when you're and, yeah and when you're creating a piece be it a bag a piece of jewelry you know when you're go starting the process and maybe we can talk a little bit about that but it is when you're looking at right i'm going to create this piece of jewelry the intention you have is to create happiness or joy in another person. Is that your kind of the outcome you want? And then it's just a matter of kind of following steps along the way and going with, with feeling. Yeah. I think it's all really emotion driven. I think it really is. I think when I go ahead and I make a piece or I design something, it really is about how will another person feel about this? Not will not will another person buy this. Mm. If I get into the like, idea that I'm going to create something for a, just to create something to sell, like a commodity based item, it's not going to work. It's not going to work for me. Mm. In 2001, I walked away from my company because I wasn't happy with what I was creating. I was so big at that point. My company was so massive. I mean, I was designing from everyone from Barney's to House of Fraser to Henry Bendel to Bloomingdale's pretty much all over the world. And I was not happy designing what I was designing. Mm. So I had to step out, step away, take a beat and basically close up shop. Cause I didn't want that. Right. I didn't need that to make me happy. I think what happens is that we live in a, a, a culture and society that says, I need that car to make me happy. I need that house to be happy. I need that, that partner to be happy. Mm. And we always, and I, it, it, it's a really, it's sad. It becomes a very sad place when you always need something else to be happy. The one thing I've realized is that what I need more, most importantly to be happy is me. And within that, I can create my bags. I can create the art. I can create what I want to create with the hope that what I create will bring happiness to others and create something. I, I've, I've kind of like looked at myself as I'm no longer a designer. I'm mm. more of a curator. Hmm. I curate stuff now right. from handbags to jewelry to home goods. I, I, I have, I have amassed an amazing group of people, 
of fellow designers who we've all come together in this massive collaboration, all doing the same thing from top chef in the world to one of the top photographers in the world to, you know, um, one of the top shoemakers and really, really come together as kind of these real artists of life to collaborate on stuff that we really think will make changes mm. in the world of fashion, in the world of food, in the world of art, photography, and really have come together sharing the same vision. And none of us, we, 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 we put our love and our feeling and our emotions in what we create. And we feel that there's a lot of heart in what we do. Mm. And you can feel that when you look at it. You can feel it when you touch it. Like when I make it, the, I have this certain bag this with a certain leather that I make and I hand distress it. I hand distress it until my, basically my hands are chapped and bleeding. Mm. And to me, that's, that's, that's what art's about. Yeah. It's about putting your heart. You know, it's funny, you have art and heart. <laughs> mm. Very good. And yeah. it, it's funny as well, I would compare a lot of, so I've been doing a lot of writing about just goals and goal setting the last year or whatever. Um, and you've heard of the kind of acronym SMART goals where you're you're making your objectives or, or your, your your goal very measurable and time bound, etc. But there's never really emotion in, in the goal. And once you have an emotional piece into it, um, you're much more likely to to, to keep to stay with it and it, it kind of ties into what you're saying there you, you know you're creating art that has emotional tied into it it still probably needs to to get done M my question i suppose is there when you, you've assembled this team of highly artistic people that are, are very passionate about what they're creating and curating how or where does the the business side come in and and how do you get that art out and into the hands of of, of people is there um is there was there gaps in your skill set that you've had to develop or or bring other people in well i yeah i think that that was trial and error when i was in my 20s mm. um i think that was a lot of the trial and error i thought you know when i first wanted to design when i was in my 20s i was like uh, this is great i i I I went to some – I was somebody who was like – you know, I was in my 20s. I was young. I was inexperienced. You know, I amassed – I went from being, you know, a, a $5,000 corporation to, you know, doing a couple hundred thousand a month. So, mm. <laughs> you know, it, it was a very – it was a very interesting – but but – but what I realized is I was still lacking that I, I, that kind of business smart. But I, I I learned it on the streets. Right. Everything I learned was pretty much on the streets, mm. from business to design. I never had any formal training. Wow. But the design yeah. piece you must have a natural ability for. Do you think, or, or could that be? Could anyone learn how to do what you do? Do you think? No, I think handbags is a very Handbags is a really interesting art. It's like architecture mm. mixed with math and science. You have to know everything from the leather, from the tannery to where the leather came from, to the weights, to the glues, to the cements, to the hardware, whether it's brass or whether it's zinc. The mechanics of handbags. You know, we look at Chanel and we look at Givenchy and we look at Coach and we look at Burberry and we look at all of these these lines and we just for some reason and i understand with society is that they just think that these things magically were made by some magical elves and arrived on the store <laughs> yeah. and and it didn't happen that way it's it's an interesting trade to be um anything from a molinary to a, sh a cobbler to a handbag maker we're very in we're, we're different than the apparel trade when you look at apparel, sometimes you have a few pieces in a pattern. When you look at handbags, we can have 60, 70, 80 pieces in a pattern. I mean, making a handbag is one of the most difficult things to make. Um, I think that's also what I love is I love the engineering and the mechanics of it. Hmm. But I learned all of that on the streets. I didn't go spend $30,000 a year to go to, to, go to a fashion school. 
you know, but I knew the idea of, of I, I knew how to market. I knew how to sell. Mm. You know, that was, that was the thing when I went to New York and I had a 104 degree temperature and I was living on my friend's floor in, Ch- in Chinatown on East Broadway in Foresight. I walked up to the pier and I had a half a booth and I was sick as a dog. And, and, you know, I remember two accounts walked up to me and the t- first two accounts was Barney's, um, in New York in anthropology. And they said, um, you know, we want your line. Mm. And I thought to myself, really? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think I actually said that. I'm like, really? I'm like, yeah. I'm like, okay. And then I'm like, let's do this. Mm. And it was a great time to design. It was a beautiful time to design because we were the small we were the small people and that's what I do today. I think that's what it's come back to, especially the millennial generation is amassing these small boutique designers, these small boutique creators like myself and the people that I've, um, I'm working with right now. Um, I think they're people who are really true to their craft. People like Ricardo Zarate, who is, he's a Peruvian chef and, and we're doing this apron line and this, 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 uh, uh, houseware f- and, and some pieces of furniture and you know Ricardo is a chef who is a true artist mm-hmm. and probably one of the best of what he does in the world if not the best mm-hmm. it's about finding these people come, having us come together and build out a real you know build out this 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 these like little mini empires but not not for monetary gain necessarily mm-hmm. but just to really help each other's craft and propel it to other levels. Mm. But anyways, going away, going back to what you're saying, I do think that at the end of the day, it's, it's, you know, you, you find yourself in design and you can lose yourself as, as a designer. Mm. Yeah. You would imagine, like I know with talking to, even in the IT world, you know, coders, developers, probably a bad comparison, but some people that just get caught up in the actual design of that and development, they need certain people to say, right, this is the deadline. This is when we need to get this complete by and shipped, etc. You know, so there's, there's probably a mix of, um, skills needed. Oh yeah, I think so. I think that, I think you start to learn, I learned the business smarts on the street. Mm. I learned, I, I learned how to do it. I, nobody ever sat down and taught me it. Right. How, how have you, de- over the years, I suppose, how have you dealt with feedback or criticism? Is that something you're, um, you develop, you, you develop a harder skin for? Interested to, to hear about that. <laughs> uh, you know, I think that's another kind of life skill that you learn. I think when you grow up kind of rough and tough, you're kind of used to people saying no. So I think when I, I think it goes back to where I said that when you walk into an interview, you walk into a meeting, whether it be Nordstrom or Bloomies or, you know, um, Harvey Nichols or whoever it may be, you know, when you walk into, when you walk into that group, you kind of prepare that they're just going to say no. Anything better than no is great. <laughs> mm. You're like, no, it doesn't work for us. Okay. Uh, uh, or there's, yeah, and it's probably diff- different in a way, though. Like, I guess if I was going in for an interview, I would have to try and sell myself and what I can do. You're bringing in a, a a product, I suppose, a finished piece that they either like it or they don't. Is there an element of you having to persuade them to look at it differently at all, or is it is it pretty black and white? Um, you know, it's interesting. In the, in the days, I, I, I believe in the old days of fashion, it used to be about the the look of the look of the design and what it is today it's about who's your brand and what's your price point right and that and that's where we get lost as boutique designers sure. that's where we get lost as more independent designers mm. because either you're cheap they want cheap or they want you know your Saint Laurent right or they want the Goyard or they want the Givenchy the problem is is that it, everyone else in the middle gets lost Right. And so when you go in right now, you're trying to sell them. You are absolutely trying to sell them. And so you're, it's really about, before it was about selling beautiful bags. Today it's more about selling brand. Mm. And you have to innovate and you have to stay in, you have to stay creative. You have to stay innovative and you have to stay relevant. 
And it's not like you have to stay relevant once a year. You have to stay relevant monthly. Mm. And a lot of these stores no longer want to pay for the goods. They want it on consignment. A lot, you know, it, it's become a very difficult day for the designer and the artist. Mm. You know, people don't respect, I find that they don't respect the art like they used to. Mm. The, they want price point, price point, price point, price point. Mm. So yes, it's very difficult to, to go in. And... I'm kind of that guy who's like, you want my stuff? Great. If you don't want it, piss off. <laughs> yeah, it's probably the right way to be. It probably takes a while to get there. Um, how has social media and the likes of Instagram helped or hindered a, a boutique artist like yourself and, 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 and others? Or, or, or has it pushed people towards more of the mainstream stuff? Um, I think social media... You know, it's interesting. I, I think that in Instagram and 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 Twitter, um, I, I you know honestly, it's it's funny because I don't even Twitter's taken such an interesting path. I'm not sure really what it is as much anymore. Um, I know for Instagram, it's it's a I, I, the engagement is a lot more mm. um, yeah. I, than than it is on Twitter. I think Twitter's become this kind of like socio political. <laughs> world <laughs> to which everything exists there mm. um even though i have a pretty massive following on on twitter um and but i find that i engage more with um instagram and i find that instagram is a um it's interesting i think it, it's what i love about it is i'm really I, i'm exhausted watching people on instagram just post photos of themselves um I'm the guy who kind of goes back to Instagram was really about like the, the picture, the art, the mm. form, the function, yeah. all that. Um, and does it help? Yeah. You know, it gets, you know, I'll tell you, you still got to get down to the hard work, which is about getting on the streets and mm. knocking on doors. Right. Yeah. That is really what it's about. Okay. Yeah. The Instagram's great. Everybody looks up. They're like, Oh, isn't that, isn't that beautiful? Isn't that nice? Isn't that, Oh, that product's great. Or can we buy it? But it's really about knocking on the doors because you got to have people feel and touch it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Especially with fashion. Sure. And I think in today when we have a world where everybody returns everything, I'm going to buy it and return it, buy it and return it, buy and return it. It's very hard to succeed. Let me take that back. It's not difficult to succeed. It's it's difficult to. Get into the stores and get your brand out there when you're not a mainstream brand. Mm. In the 90s, I was a mainstream brand because mm -hmm. I graced pretty much every shelf in the world from Tokyo to England to Ireland to Germany throughout the United States and Canada. And now on this, in the second version of the second chapter of Greg Herman, I am finding it a lot more difficult. Hmm. Not that that's going to sway me, but it's still, I have found it to be very difficult. Um, but if you ask me, if I, if I, if I would do anything else, no. Hmm. Yeah. I'll live in my car and do what I love doing. And I've lived in I've lived in some crappy places and done what I've done. I've lived on floors. I've lived, I spent I basically lived out of my car and did what I love doing. Yeah. Kind of goes back to J.K. Rowling, you know. <laughs> With you know, when she wrote Harry Potter, she lived in her car. Mm hmm. Yeah, following your passion ultimately, and you know, not not caring. I suppose, as you said, it's not all about the monetary and and that as long as you're following it. A couple of final ones, maybe to wrap up, but. <laughs> I always talk to, I don't always talk, but I sometimes ask people in these sort of interviews if there are struggles between being a perfectionist versus having something good enough. And I would imagine yeah. this is one that for you, I'm interested to hear, it's a, it's a question that uh, you, you'll have an interesting answer for. <laughs> being good enough and versus... Perfectionism. The perfectionism. Mm. 
it's always like it's 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 a minute my it's it's literally a minute by minute balancing act. Mm. It's a very interesting question. I think especially with an artist, it's it's really hard to find the balance between when to call it mm. and when is enough and when is you know the the idea of perfectionism. I think that what I try to I'm very ambitious when it comes to designing. I like to design things that are really out there and and you should see the stuff that's not even on that that never even made it into production that just sits in my sample my you know my sample portfolio and in my patterns. Hmm. Um I think it's such an interesting question it's such a multi-layered question. Hmm. I I have found that perfectionism personally when I'm perfect, there's no room for God. Hmm. I'm a very imperfect being. I think most things in the world are imperfect. No trees perfectly grow, you know, grow straight. Hmm. You know, you can't, no, no, no. When you, when you, when you look at the, when you look at anything, whether it's a building or a house or anything, it's, it's nothing. There's always an, imp- there's always an imperfection, right? Yeah. So I think the idea is for me is about accepting and embracing every imperfection that I have and not trying to make them perfect, but allowing them to be the way they are so they can build themselves out and grow. Hmm. So it's really harnessing my imperfections. Yeah, no, I, I like the answer. Uh, I think uh, it's one I would ponder a lot about, and I I think that the t- once I once a long time ago somebody mentioned about you know the fact that nothing can be perfect and don't be striving for perfectionism. Just uh, I think it was a strive for excellence because excellence has no kind of is infinity. Uh, you know, there's there's no end to it, um, and that's always stuck with me. So. I think that's uh, something similar and we're all perfectly imperfect. I I would agree there. Um, I I might wrap it up with just a couple more. And you mentioned you have a mantra and you you have one that you would say on a regular basis. Is is there any, is is there a favorite cliche or mantra that you have? Mm. I think that, um, I I I think there's a, there's a few. I think that uh, what I've realized in, doing what I do is that I, 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 in order for me to grow, I have to not worry about you liking me. Mm -hmm. I think that we live in a world where we all want to be liked too much. And the second that we can actually stop worrying and be so overly concerned about you liking me or being liked is the time that we can really grow. And I have found in my life that when I've struggled the most in anything from business to relationships to just daily struggles, the reason why I struggle the most in those things and when I struggle the most, the one thing that I could be, I am aware of, the one thing, Rob, that I'm aware of and every struggle that I have in my life is I can sit back and go, the reason why I have that struggle is because there's too much of me between me and that thing. Mm. So I looked at from relationships to business affairs to whatever it may be. There's, t- I've always noticed that the common thread, the common denominator is that there's too much of me between me and that thing. There's too much of me between me and that relationship. There's too much of me between me and that person. And the second that I can be accountable for that, and realize that and step away from that, I can be finally free Mm. and have the relationships that I want with other people to have the business relationships. I want with those other people to have the communication and the freedom and freedom from fear and anxiety in life. Mm. The second I release that of me, I'm good. And I think that's important. Mm. And yeah. I think that in, in, in this world, there's too much of everyone between them and everyone else. 
is getting out of your own way as easy as noticing it and clicking your fingers or, or is there there's work involved how, how do you do it I suppose the million dollar question there I've worked on that every single day of my life and I am so profoundly aware of when I'm in that hmm. and sometimes it's just getting up I think that what I've realized about myself and about view, about observing other people is that nobody looks up hmm Everybody looks straight forward and down, mm-hmm. but no one looks up. And I have found that one of the things that really keeps me aware and keeps me accountable is looking up, mm. having a view, not just of what's in front of me, not what's just at the ground, but also what's up. Mm-hmm. Having this all this, this really 360 experience. Mm. And that's what keeps me centered. That's what keeps me alert. It's about taking in every little bit of what's going on Mm. and being aware. And so is it this, it's always a, it's always an exercise, but I've really, I think have this, I've really evolved and, and developed an inner awareness to which I can really click my fingers now and be like, I'm done. I'm out. Mm. And that's, but that takes a lot of work. Sure. It doesn't always happen. And also, it's also about taking a leap of faith and knowing that whatever you're going through now at 9.15 is not going to be the same thing that you're going to go through at 9.20. Hmm. And to me, that was an important lesson. And I think I still continue to learn all of these lessons of life. And I realize, like, you know, we even go into a lot of my story in, in, in terms of the real the real cracks in the dark, the dark times. Um but those times have allowed me to be where I'm at today and be a better human. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think every, if we can take that view and perspective and yeah. know that all these things that happened along the way have been essential to get to you to where you are now, then I think that you can make peace with those things a bit more. You know, you can uh, accept it for sure. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I will say though, having having visited and traveling through Ireland was a very profound experience. It was one of the most magical times I've ever had in my life. Well, that's good to hear. I'm glad you you enjoyed it. It was great to meet you when you were here as well. So that that was a a, a great uh, opportunistic connection that we made in our. We're obviously putting this together, so it's been it's been wonderful to do that. Uh, last question, I always ask. Sure. The last question is a book that uh, some something has stuck out for you from a book you've read either recently or, or whenever uh, that that you could potentially recommend. I have a book page on the website that I like to add them in after uh, after the the episode comes out. Oh, that's interesting. Um, I would have to say. You mean my favorite book? And anything that's what, what what comes up when I ask the question? Is there one? If it's your favorite, go with that one. Um, I would have to say one of my favorite authors is probably. Wow, that's a really good question. Um, take your time. I right. would say I would say probably finding joy. Finding joy. <laughs> and um, it's a beautiful book. Um, it's by this author, uh, Charlotte Castle. Okay. And it's 101 ways to free your spirit and dance with life. Hmm. Nice. And I, I find that that's, it's, it's one of my favorite, my favorite things. And I, I, I want I, I just want to read one thing if you don't mind. Go for it. Yeah. It says joy is a source of personal power. Joy awakens as we open ourselves to the wonder of the universe, both inside us and around us. As we allow the expansive power of joy to flow through us, our awareness expands, and we see beyond the concrete world to a world of love, intimacy, creativity, and wisdom. That's a great way to end it. (laughs) Love that. Very good. Greg, it's been a real pleasure to chat with you in the last hour. I learned a lot about just, not just about your uh, your own 
backstory, but also about the, the, the fashion industry a little bit, touched on some of that. As I said at the start, we didn't know where this could go, and I think that's the beauty of doing these conversations. Uh, that's what I get the most out of, not really having a, a clear plan wherever um, the journey brings us, I think, is, is the right place to go. Um, so thanks for doing that. Your website is Thank House you, of... Oh no, it, it's been a pleasure. Houseofherman.com is the website. Is there other ways people can connect in with you? I know on social, maybe just give a call out for best ways to, to connect. Yeah, you can connect with me um, on both Twitter and Instagram. And my handle is uh, the Greg Herman, uh, T-H-E, Greg Herman. And uh, uh, you can visit us also, see our new line and our new collections and designs at uh, www.houseofherman.com. Excellent. And I didn't ask you about that tattoo on uh, the um, picture. Is it on LinkedIn or is it on, is it on uh, the inside of your lip? Is that yours? Or, or <laughs> <laughs> It's a very good job of photoshopping. Okay, very good. <laughs> uh, I must get one of them done myself. Um, it looks, yeah, it looks very yeah. good. I'm, sure I'm sure there's somebody out there who would uh, who would be open to getting the, my name tattooed on their lips. I just haven't asked them. Um, uh, <laughs> it could be a whole new fashion line. Um, yes, yes. A lot more painful, though. Absolutely. Greg, look, I'll let you go. Thanks again so much. We'll stay in touch, and I'll be in touch with you um, before I, I release this. But uh, it's been great to chat. Likewise. Same to you, man. Take care. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Hey, guys. Just before you go, I'd love to hear from you if anything specific stood out from that episode, something you might take away and try and implement in your own personal or professional life to help make you that little bit better on the other side is there anything you think i could do better to make the show even more enjoyable more impactful and maybe meaningful so drop me a note rob at rob of the green .ie, or connect in on any of the social platforms at rob of the green we also have a community on facebook check that out if you're really enjoying the show maybe you could try and leave a rating or a review on itunes apple podcasts app Go in there, give us a rating, let us know how we're doing. That'll help with the ranking of the podcast up those charts. The more folks that potentially see it because we're high up, the better. The more that might listen, that never heard of it before. And the goal of the show is to try and reach more and more people and have that impact more and more. So that's down to you. Please do help me with that. I'm not going down the route of hiring podcast promoters, quote unquote, from other parts of the world because they say they can help with the ranking and I don't really believe them or it's not very authentic. Help me do it in an authentic way. I really appreciate it. This year, I'm going more all in on Patreon. So it's three bucks a month. You can sign up, subscribe to Rob of the Green on Patreon.com. That will give you access to Patreon-only content. Nearly all the episodes of the 864 podcast are on there and new ones will be added only there. The 1% Better Show will have early releases there, but will still come out for free on robofthegreen.ie. There will also be live shows this year, some phone-in shows, extra content. Three euros a month will hopefully, the more folks that subscribe, allow me to do more and more stuff on there, add more and more content. At the end of the day, that's the price of a pair of socks, maybe, that you might lose, or a coffee. One way or the other, it's up to you. If you want to join, you'll see get free stuff otherwise but if you're enjoying what we're doing help us grow help us expand it i'd really appreciate that adding new stuff onto the website all the time there's an affiliates page under the be better drop down check in there there's training courses that you can sign up to more and more stuff will come in over time into season three now of this fun fun journey huge learning hopefully you're getting something from it too stick with it let's keep going enjoy the journey even more have a great day week weekend and thanks for checking it out good luck